Hi church, my name is Tim Power. I'm one of the pastors here at Salem. I'm so glad to be spending this time with you, seeking God and seeking to be changed by God's power. Now, this weekend, as a country, we celebrate Memorial Day, where with grateful hearts, we remember those who gave their lives in service to our country. Now, I am personally grateful to all those who paid that ultimate sacrifice. And I think these days of national reflection are really useful for us. It, it helps us to be in one shared frame of mind. And specifically, this holiday makes us think about life and death, what's worth living for and what's worth dying for. Now, as Christians, we have a very particular view of both life and death. So many who do not hold any religious viewpoint, for them, life is all there is, and death is just the period at the end of the sentence. That's it, fade to black, roll credits. But as Christians, we have something different. We have this word hope. Now hope is one of the theological virtues in our belief system. It's this idea that death is not the end of life, but rather it's a doorway into eternity. In a sense, it's a movement into a reality that for us is more real than anything we've experienced up until that point. And Christians believe, in fact, that this world, this life is not where we belong in the truest sense and that when we die, we're going home. The word that Christians associate with our eternal home, that place that we're going to end up is heaven. Now. Some people will criticize the worldview that we have and, and say that if we are focused solely on heaven, then we're no earthly good. Uh, I really have to disagree with that proposition. In fact, I believe that if we want to change this world, then we need to have our hope set in heaven. Now, over the last couple of weeks, we've been journeying through the book of Ecclesiastes in a sermon series that we're calling Seasons of Life. Just to catch you up real quick, Ecclesiastes is a book from the Old Testament, and it's part of a genre that we call wisdom literature. This includes books like Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Job. Now, the book of Ecclesiastes gives us a really unique perspective on wisdom. It's from the point of view of a man traditionally believed to be King Solomon, who has had it all, he's done it all, and at the end of his life, he's come to believe that life is hevel. That might be a new word to you, hevel. It's a word that's used over and over again in Ecclesiastes. It's sometimes translated as meaningless or pointless, but really, literally translated, it means smoke or vapor. It means that over life, he has learned that life can't be controlled or manipulated. When you try to grab hold of it, your hand slips right through. So I want you to hear these words from the very beginning of the book of Ecclesiastes. The words of the teacher of the assembly, David's son, king in Jerusalem. Perfectly pointless, says the teacher. Perfectly pointless. Everything is pointless. When he says that word pointless, that's hevel. So over the course of this book, Solomon is processing these feelings of powerlessness. He's processing Hevel, and, and he comes to believe that the best course of action is actually just to accept what he can't control and let God be God. Now, another great preoccupation with the book of Ecclesiastes, besides Hevel, is the idea of death and mortality. The author mentions death over and over again, and he wonders, why should we work so hard just to watch our legacy disappear after we die? That is, of course, meaningless, but towards the end of the book of Ecclesiastes, Solomon gives us a picture that is a little bit closer to our Christian understanding of hope, like I was talking about earlier. Listen to these words. Life, lovely while it lasts, is soon over. Life, as we know it, precious and beautiful, ends. The body is put back in the same ground it came from. The spirit returns to God who first breathed it. It's all smoke, nothing but smoke. The quester says that everything's smoke. Now, in week one of the sermon series, 
we talked about the two voices that we hear in Ecclesiastes. There's the voice of the author of the book, that's anonymous, but we don't really know who wrote the book. And then there's the voice of Solomon, who is a character in the book. Now, we only hear the author's voice at the very beginning when he introduces Solomon, and at the very end of the book where the author gives us their unique perspective on everything we've heard up till this point. So hear these words from the author of Ecclesiastes. Besides being wise himself, the quester also taught others knowledge. He weighed, examined, and arranged many proverbs. The quester did his best to find the right words and write the plain truth. The words of the wise prod us to live well. They're like nails hammered home, holding life together. They are given by God, the one shepherd. But regarding anything beyond this, dear friend, go easy. There's no end to the publishing of books and constant study wears you out, so you're no good for anything else. The last and final word is this, fear God, do what he tells you. And that's it. Eventually, God will bring everything that we do out into the open and judge it according to its hidden agenda, whether it's good or evil. Now, that last verse, it's a hint of eternity, and it's actually kind of scary sounding on its own. Wait a minute. Are you saying that God's going to judge me according to what I've done? I might be in trouble, right? Well, that would have been the case except Jesus. See, in Romans 8, 1, we hear these words from the Apostle Paul. With the arrival of Jesus the Messiah, that fateful dilemma is resolved. Those who enter into Christ's being here for us no longer have to live under a continuous low-lying black cloud. A new power is in operation. The spirit of life in Christ, like a strong wind, has magnificently cleared the air, freeing you from a faded lifetime of brutal tyranny at the hands of sin and death. See, because Jesus' death and resurrection, because he died for our sins and was raised again in power, we have hope beyond heaven. Let me say that again. Because of Jesus, we have hope beyond heaven. Hevel. And because we have hope, it actually changes everything. See, real hope for eternity should mean that we live differently now and that we love differently now. And, and I think a quick look at history shows that the people who have made the greatest contributions to this world are actually people who thought the most of the next world. See, the early church had their hearts set on heaven, on eternity. And that drove them to live selfless lives. See, they didn't worry about being persecuted because even being killed, as the Apostle Paul said, for me to live is Christ, but to die is actually gain. That means I'm going to share the message and the love of Jesus, even if it costs me everything, even if it costs me my life, because what's the worst that can happen? You could kill me and I would spend all of eternity with my Savior. And, and I think about the great British abolitionist, William Wilberforce. See, it wasn't until he was transformed by a spiritual awakening that he devoted his life to ending the British slave trade. See, he had an eternal perspective that made him long for justice on earth. And the love of Jesus changed his heart, and so he, in turn, changed the world. Or I like to think about the minister and civil rights activist Martin Luther King Jr. Now, if you read the entire text of his I Have a Dream speech, you'll see that he actually uses his heavenly hope as a guide to what justice on earth could really look like. His longing for heaven didn't make him useless on earth. No, it actually made him a world changer. It drove him to bring heaven down to earth. See, if we want to change this world, we need to have our hopes set on heaven. Now, as we close our time together, I, I want you to ask a very serious question of yourself. What do you think happens after all of this? And we all choose what we believe on this matter, whether we believe that this life is 
all we've got and so I got to make it count? Or if you believe that heaven is our home, so we should live like Jesus lived and love like Jesus loved. See, personally, I choose to believe in the hope of heaven because of what I read in 1 John 3.16. This is how we've come to understand and experience love. Christ sacrificed his life for us. This is why we ought to live sacrificially for our fellow believers and not just be out for ourselves. See, I believe that my life here is a dress rehearsal for an eternity of knowing the love of Jesus and sharing the love of Jesus. That takes me from hevel to hope. Will you pray with me? Holy God, I thank you for the hope of eternity. And I pray that it wouldn't just make me think about the future, but that it would make me live differently now. Lord God, I pray that the hope of heaven would transform my life and all of our lives so that we could live like Jesus lived and love like Jesus loved. This is our prayer, God. We're seeking for you to change us now. We pray this in your holy name. Amen.